Okay, uh, our next speaker will be Miranda Kirsten with her presentation on promoting beneficial insects. Again, this talk will have a pre-presentation poll, so if you can go ahead and fill that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Miranda Kirsten. I'm the IPM program manager at New Mexico State University. I'm based out of the Agricultural Science Center at Los Lunas. I've been in this position for about three and a half years, and most of the work that I'm involved with includes uh, native plants and pollinators and other beneficial insects and monitoring in the, them in different settings. So today I'm going to teach you a little bit about who those insects are and some steps you can take to promote them in your landscape. So let's start with just a broad overview of what beneficial insects are. Um, they are just going to be any insect that's helping to perform an ecosystem service. An ecosystem service is quite simply a property of an ecosystem that benefits humans either directly or indirectly. So some of the many ways insects help us include by um, helping with nutrients, um, recycling, they decompose plant and animal waste, they help to aerate soil particles with help, which help us with soil quality. Other animals eat insects like fish and birds and other wildlife. And then what we will be focusing on are natural pest control and pollination. So for the purposes of today, we're just going to uh, consider beneficial insects as those that uh, provide that pest control. So predatory insects and parasitoid insects, other terms for these that you may hear are going to be natural enemies, which is just an organism that feeds on another organism. Or you might also hear the term biocontrol agent for these. We will also talk a little bit about those pollinators since they are important for our food production and um, many of our native flowers rely on them. We'll also go into a little bit of more like the background of insects so we can understand fully what their needs are throughout their different life cycle stages. So within our insects, we're going to have two different forms of metamorphosis or life cycle stages. So many of them are undergoing complete metamorphosis. With complete metamorphosis, we have four distinct stages like you can see with the ladybug life cycle here. So they'll start out as an egg, that egg will hatch into a larva, and then you'll find it pupates, and then the adult looks completely different than the larval stage. A lot of times, these larval stages will also have different food sources than the adult stage. So if you're thinking in terms, too, of insect pests, sometimes the larva and or the adult stage may cause plant damage. Other insects will go through incomplete metamorphosis. So the example here is of a milkweed bug. Within this type of metamorphosis, there are three types of life stages, the egg, the nymph, and the adult. Although the nymphs may go through multiple molts, but in most cases, the nymphs and adults appear very similar, but the adults may have wings. Just kind of an overview of our insect pollinators, since there are a couple of animal pollinators, but we don't work on those with our projects. Um, so when we're thinking of our insect pollinators, the biggest group are going to be bees, but wasps may also be visiting flowers, as are uh, different flies, beetles, and then butterflies and moths. But today we're just going to focus on the bees. Um, they're the most efficient pollinators because they are the only insect that relies on pollen for both the larval and the adult stage. And they are also the ones that come to mind most. So within the US, we actually have over 4,000 species of bees that are native to the country that have been identified. In New Mexico, we have a uh, I think it's the third largest diversity of bees with over a thousand species that have been identified. 
Um, within these bees, they'll be both specialists and generalists. A specialist may feed only on a certain species or family of plants, while generalists can visit a wide variety of plants. So when we're thinking about planting for pollinators, we need to consider which plants are going to attract them. We also have ground nesting and stem nesting bees. And then with our, our wild bees, there are activities based on season. So I'm not gonna talk about managed bees at all today or honey bees at all today because they are managed, but their activity is based on temperature. So you'll actually see them year round when it's above 55 degrees Fahrenheit about. So here's examples of those two nesting behaviors. So 70% of our wild bees are ground nesting. They are building their nests in bare patches of ground or mounds of soil. You might see um, in this picture here shows more of a, a sandy area that has a lot of, of those mounds in it. So while a lot of these bees are solitary, you may see aggregations of nests in an area if it's a good nesting site. Sometimes they'll even be along dirt roads. The rest of our bees are going to be stem nesting, so they're building their nest in dead trees, other woody debris, logs, or even dry stems if you leave those up in the garden. With the other half of our beneficial insects groups, here are some of the more common natural enemy groups. So these are going to include things like different flies, lacewings, wasps, are also going to be predatory, our many pirate bugs, assassin bugs, and then some of our beetles. So with our natural enemies, they can range in a variety of sizes. The minute pirate bugs are just going to be a couple of millimeters long, and then things like mantids are, are much larger. Most of them are going to be generalist, so they're feeding on a large variety of insects. And the ones we're going to go over are not inclusive of all beneficial insects, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about the groups that we include in our research projects. So we'll start with the surface fly, also known as a hover fly or flower fly. Um, these insects are predatory as larvae. You often don't see them, as you can see in this picture here, they're quite small. That one's eating a oleander aphid, and they blend in with the plants really well. The adults, which you'll see hovering around flowers, hence the name, hover flies are feeding on pollen and nectar. So the adults are not predatory, just the larval stage. But the larvae are great predators of a lot of our small soft-bodied insects, like aphids, scale insects, spider mites and thrips, and you're gonna see them active throughout most of the growing season. So these surfeit flies are overwintering in as either a larva, a pupa, or an adult, depending on the species, in leaf litter or, or soil. So their overwintering habitat is something to keep in mind while you're thinking of what habitat to provide them. One of our parasitoid groups are tachinid flies. Um, we'll talk about two parasitoid groups today, um, but with tachinid flies, the female is going to lay the, their eggs either on or near the host. The host can be a variety of insect groups, butterflies, so different caterpillars, beetles, grasshoppers, um, squash bugs. But with these tachinid flies, the larva is going to develop inside of their host, and they're eventually going to kill that host. So. The larval stage is a parasite, and then the adults will be found visiting flowers. These pictures show the chicken and fly larva coming out of uh, two different caterpillars. So those caterpillars are unfortunately dead. Now the adults can look sometimes like houseflies, like in the middle picture here, but others look a little more distinct, but they tend to have stout bristly hairs. And these tachinid flies are going to go through multiple generations per year, and they're overwintering as a larva or pupa within their host, some, while others are pupating in the leaf litter. Another common predator is the minute pirate bug. So this one 
goes through incomplete metamorphosis so that immature and adult stages are going to look fairly similar. Both stages are predators, but they're also feeding on pollen and nectar. They're very tiny. So this picture is of a Lancet Corapsis and there's a little tiny pirate bug in there, but they're kind of starts to become easier to see if you look for that X pattern on the flower. So these are the smallest of our predatory true bugs. They're going through a couple of generations per year in overwintering in leaf litter or under bark, but they're also going to be active in the late spring to the summer. A couple of our beetles main group is um, ladybugs. So ladybugs, as I showed in that life cycle picture, the larvae look very different from the adults. Um, some people don't realize that is a lady going to become a ladybug, um, but ladybugs are great predators to have around. They're feeding on a lot of soft-bodied insects as well as insect eggs, but the adults will be supplementing their diets with uh, floral resources. So this one just shows some of the common adult forms of, of species that we have here in New Mexico. So um, many of these are feeding on aphids primarily, although they will eat other pests, but we have um, things like in the upper left here, the two-spotted ladybug. The bottom right shows the parentheses lady beetle, which has a parentheses on its body. The convergent lady beetle in the upper middle here is very commonly seen. Um, then we also have the twice-stabbed lady beetle, which is named because it has it is black with two red dots on its body. Um, but these ones will feed on scales, armored scales, and then. Two other common species that are actually introduced are the seven spotted lady beetle and the multicolored lady beetle, which has a black W on its head. Another great predator to have around is going to be our lace wings. So the larvae are pretty small, they're on the bottom right here. They're also known as aphid lines that eat a lot of aphids, but other other soft-bodied insects too. The adults are often not seen because they're active at night, but they have lacy wings. So with lace wings, you're more likely to look for them. You're more likely going to try to find the egg, which is very distinct it's on a stalk. And they lay them that way so that when the first ones hatch, they can't eat their, their um, siblings, I guess. So both the larval and adults are um, stages are predatory um, and they will overwinter in this adult stage in leaf litter. Then finally we'll do our um, hemipteran predators. So we have with our research we group them into two types of wasps. So the first are the large predatory wasps. The larvae of wasps are actually predators. We just don't or we just don't see them because they're underground, usually within the or within the nest. Um, the adults are also predators, but they'll also be visiting um, flowers for nectar. So our wasps are going to be eating a variety of different prey, and act activity is going to be based on species. But they will be nesting in soil cavities, um, like a in like I have a nest in my rock wall, for example, or in wood. Uh, a lot of our wasps are actually solitary and they rarely sing. So they are good to have around. And then the last group are our small parasitoid wasps. Like the tachinid flies, the larval stage is a parasite or a parasitoid, so it's going to kill its host. The adults are going to be visiting flowers for nectar pollen and honeydew. So different species are going to attack different life stages of their different host. Um, so they may target eggs, the larval or the nymph stage, or adults. And they'll overwinter in a variety of stages as well. So there is a large diversity between our within our parasitoid wasp group. It covers multiple superfamilies, um, but they can range quite significantly in size. 
So for example, this one in the upper right is next to a penny. That's how small that one is. Whereas this one on the right here is a giant ichneumon wasp and it has an extremely long ovipositor. Um, so this one will actually not sting you, but it looks a little frightening. But because a lot of them are so tiny, we're gonna look for other signs to see that these parasitoid wasps are present in our landscape. So one ex commonly known example is going to be with the tomato hornworm. So this hornworm is covered in a protoned wasp cocoon. So in this situation, the larva have fed on the inside of the caterpillar, and then they exit the caterpillar to build their cocoons. So the adults will emerge after four days in the in the pupa. Um, but if you see a cap on the cocoon, that means that the wasp has has emerged. So if you see this on your hornworms, leave them there so that those wasps can complete their life cycle and infect. Another example is these galls. So galls are a normal growth of a plant that can be caused by a variety of insects. Um, the galls are made to provide shelter for that insect and they can be found on stems, leaves, and other plant parts. But many of these gall forming insects are actually parasitized by wasps. So to see if a parasitoid wasp has exited, you're going to look for an exit hole that's larger than what the gall forming wasp would do. So those are our insects. Um, this figure shows the habitat need for pollinators, and I think it works well for other beneficial insects as well. So for our insects to complete our life cycle, their life cycles, we need to make sure they have resources for um, food, reproduction, and um, so food and nesting and overwintering habitat mainly. Um, but they will need flowers to feed on, um, places to reproduce, which is going to vary based on the insect you are trying to. Um, promote, and then uh, they will likely need supplementary resources to complete their life cycle. So that can be additional food, especially in terms of our predatory insect um, nesting material for those that build nests in um, wood, for example, and then hibernation sites. So when we are looking to attract and support our beneficial insects, the easiest thing to do is to first identify the resources that you already have. Which plants are being used and are there nest sites present? And then once you have that initial inventory, you can decide how you need to augment those, those floral resources and nest sites. So with floral diversity, we want to make sure we have a diversity of uh, sizes, shapes, colors, and fragrance to attract the most of our insects, um, small flowers tend to attract um, a lot of hemipterans, for example, while larger flowers attract more of the larger ones. Um, and then bees that we see in whites, yellows, blues, greens, and UV. So not red, but red might have some UV to it. And then we also wanna consider having a diversity of flowers that flower throughout the season. So it's recommended to have three to five plant species flowering in each season. So you have a continuous uh, supply of floral resources for the insects that can be present. Within this, we want to consider plant diversity. So that's going to be having both native plants. You can have native plants and ornamentals. You can put them in patches. Um, grouping the flowers in patches may have, does have some pros and cons, so it may attract more pollinators, but it also may attract more pests. And then having that diversity of plants back just increases the diversity and abundance of your beneficial insects. And within IPM, these practices are all a part of conservation biological control. So this is just where we're manipulating our habitat to make sure we're favoring the existing natural enemies as opposed to buying um, and releasing natural enemies. So quite simply, we're just adding those floral resources, we're minimizing chemical exposure, and then um, in land management, a lot of our 
Insects are overwintering in the soil, so minimizing disturbance to their overwintering site. And we can do this in uh, with annuals and perennial flowers. So oftentimes annual plants are called insectary plants. So these are just plants that are grown to provide resources for those beneficial insects. And this using insectary plants extension guide is a great resource for that. So this was um, originally done as it's researched by Tess Grasswitz and then Ashley Bennett updated it. Um, so the benefits of using annual plants for these beneficial insects include uh, these annual plants are often quick to establish, they'll readily produce flowers. It's really easy to rotate them and move them around your, your landscape. And then they're often a little lower cost than perennial plants. So the mixture that she found was best for this included California bluebell, buckwheat, dill, plains, coreopsis, cosmos, and alyssum. Um, this flower mix had flowers for most of the season. Um, one thing to consider though is that alyssum can attract pests. So if you have a related crop, you might not want to plant alyssum there. So then the work that I've been more involved with, um, which was started by Ashley Bennett, has been using perennial plants for beneficial insects. So perennial plants also have many benefits. Um, they will provide yearly flower resources since they're flowering every year. Um, one thing to consider is that some perennials will take a few years before they do produce flowers, though. A lot of our perennial plants are drought tolerant or can use um, less amounts of water once they are established. And then since we're just planting once, there's lower maintenance. And then these perennial plants are attracting a diverse group of insects. So at Los Lunas, um, this is a picture of what our study plots used to look like. So we had seven different mixes of six species of perennial flowers. And within these plots, uh, we did visual observations. So we looked at those broad groups of insects. And then we also did vacuum samples so that we could look at um, more of the bee diversity and then parasitoids and those smaller insects that are harder to see by eye. So I just pulled uh, the results from a couple of our mixes to talk about today. So like I said, we had seven. Um, our, our second mix was for native bees and it actually did attract the most native bees with the visual observations. So these graphs I know are kind of busy um, called the pollination network. So the top bar are our insect groups. So we have solitary wasps, small bees, or small wasps, surface flies, large wasps, bumblebees, and lady beetles. The bottom bars are our flowers, and the wider the black bar is, it means that the more visits occurred for both the insects and the plants. And then the gray bars show the number of interactions between the plant and each insect group. So in this mix, we had low mallow, purple prairie clover, Engelman daisy, uh, prairie coneflower, James buckwheat, and desert penstemon. You can see, except for the buckwheat, they were all visited fairly often, and solitary bees were our, our biggest group um, visiting this mix in the two years that we did this study. Our other native bee group um, mix, which had blanket flower, landsleaf, coreopsis, hyssop, McDoug gold verbena, that James Buckwheat was in it again, and then white fairy clover. Um, also attracted a lot of our, our solitary bees that you can see in this mix. The coreopsis was more, had more visits than the rest of our flowers, but that's probably more because the coreopsis bloomed the longest. So it was, I think most of the season it was flowering. So coreopsis is a good flower for long season blooms. And then for more of our overall beneficial insects, so including those natural enemies, our last, our, our second beneficial insects mix had, mix had the most visitors. So that one had that coreopsis again, hyssop again, mule's ear, uh, rid riddles, ragwort, horsetail, milkweed, and Rocky Mountain penstemon. And in this mix, uh, 
solitary bees were still most of the visitors that we did see, but it has higher amounts of small wasps and large wasps. You have um, five minutes left. Thank you. Um, so in this mix, this even though it doesn't have the most visitors, the pensum constrictus was great because it flowered most of the growing season and it had ex extra floral nectary. So it was covered in ladybugs even when it wasn't flowering. And then the last mix I wanted to talk about was just our one of our natural enemies mix. So this one had globe mallow, mule's ear, showy milkweed, um, the Damanita daisy, buckwheat again, buckwheat, and uh, this mix, we just had more of our wasps, large and small wasps visiting the different flowers. So I also have data on which flowers have the most, but I won't talk about that today, but if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me. So just kind of an overview, we want to encourage our beneficial insects by planting flowers in a diversity, so diversity of flowers throughout the season, provide um, overwintering habitat, alternative prey, consider that uh, nesting habitat for insects. And then in regards to uh, pest control, just be careful what you're spraying and when you're spraying since uh, they can, insecticides can kill the insect you want to. And then I briefly just want to bring up our new project with uh, Dr. DC. He's the Extension Genetic Culture Specialist, and I um, are doing a project growing flowers in vineyards in New Mexico because a lot of them practice bare ground management between the rows. So we're going to put flowers in different sites to um, just show that there's many benefits, including attracting pollinators, but also with soil health and microbiology. And, uh, maybe with aesthetics. So something to look for in the future. And then here's my contact info. I do all of the IPM social media. So feel free to check us out on there. And I, I will take questions. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, we will now begin the post presentation quote, uh, poll. So if everyone could go ahead and answer that. So for your first question, uh, do you know what makes little pencil eraser sized dimples in bare soil? Little pencil eraser says it could be a bit. So there's a bunch, there's several different insects that, that nest in the soil. So it could be a few different ones. Um, so you could put a little cover over it to see what's coming, coming in or out. Just keep an eye on it. Okay, thank you. Your next question. I've seen mantis eggs sold in nurseries before. Is this a gray area bug because it eats both beneficial and dangerous insects or should the case not be placed in the garden at all? And so mantids are, that is true. So mantids are great because they do eat a lot of things though, but they will eat indiscriminately and eat anything around them. Um, so that one, I, it more depends on how many pets. So a lot of this is situational, you know, how many pests you have versus how many how many beneficial insects. So they're not bad to add. You can also, if you see the egg case outside, just move it to where you want it, want it to be. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, uh, I also see ladybugs sold in nurseries. Is it more desirable to attract them with native flowers or purchase them 500 adults to a bag? Yeah, so the problem with purchasing those ladybugs is, um, you know, ladybugs can fly. Uh, so oftentimes if you buy the adults and release them, they'll just leave. So that is where having habitat for them will help. And then sometimes when they collect the adult ladybugs, they're in um, a diapause stage. So that when they become active again, their instinct is to migrate. So I have heard if you do want to go that route that you can put them in like a, like a sugary water on their wings as glue so they can stay. But I would recommend putting in habitat for the ladybugs. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Considering growing vegetables in hoop houses during late fall and early spring, do any predatory insect life cycles change to meet the new food source or do vegetables grow in off season not influence beneficial insect habits? So a lot of our insect activity is driven by temperature and day length, but I think you can also, but you can mimic the temperature temperature in the hoop houses is going to be different than from the temperature outside temperature there are some you can get to work in there and a lot of them are active 
Like I'll even see, maybe now's not a good time, but like with the, the surface flies, I'll see them as early as February and then really late into the season. So a lot of them are active longer than we probably think they are. So I think they would still provide some pest control in a hoop house. Okay, thank you. That's all the time we have for now. 